Okay. Well, um, all right, so uh, um, are there any questions uh, before I start? Uh, either about like how the class is going or what the hell is Sean talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well, I'll just start talking about. I mean, so you know, uh, there was a lecture I gave last night. I don't know if like only one person attended it. I don't know if, uh, I mean, obviously, it's not the usual class time, people can't make it. So, um, but uh, so I'm not going to try to summarize what happened there, but um, um, maybe some of the things I say today would help clarify that to if you didn't get a chance to see the recording of that. Um, but okay, so I'm just going to start talking about the third epic of part three. But I'm, I actually I'm not since I only assigned a little bit of that. Um, Right, there were two parts of the reading today. The very end of the third epic of part three, and then the beginning of part four. Um, so part three is all about theoretical philosophy. That is, like metaphysics or epistemology, you know, how we can know about the world, uh, or what kind of things there are, or something like that. Whereas part four is about practical philosophy. That is, it's about, roughly speaking, the answer to the question, what should I do? <laughs> um, so, uh, um, I said, I think uh, most of what I wanted to say about part three last night. So, um, I guess one of the things I said was that if this were, of course, on the history of German idealism or on Schelling, you know, or on this book as a whole, then part three would be really important. It's probably spent a lot of time talking, especially about the second epic, which I didn't assign any on <laughs> um, because you know that's where a lot of the details of Schelling's interpretation slash the replacement of Kant are all buried in there but for the purpose of going forward I think most of those details are actually not so important right like the authors we're going to be reading after this are not really interested in that stuff but they are very interested in what comes up in the beginning of part four about the possibility of freedom and how it depend, could depend on something else and things like that, right? So, um, so I, you know, I just assigned a little bit of the, the beginning of this to show um, where Schelling, how Schelling thinks why Schelling thinks, thinks it seems to us that where uh, our knowledge is empirical and it's based on sensations that come from something alien to us, right? And then the very end of part three, which is basically the transition to part four. Um, so, I mean, I know that that reading from the end of part three is probably pretty confusing without the context, like without what came before it. But I think uh, it's, I, I still felt like I couldn't leave it out completely that you wouldn't understand what was happening in the beginning of part four. So, um, so, so, you know, the third epic of part three is mostly about what Schelling calls transcendental abstraction. 
Now, I mean, it's not always easy to know what Kant means by transcendental, but uh, I think uh, what Schelling means by transcendental, and I think actually this is the right way of interpreting what Kant means too. What Schelling means by transcendental is that it has to do with objectivity as such, as opposed to as some determinate object. Um, Right, so transcendental abstraction is a kind of, as opposed to empirical abstraction. Empirical abstraction is um, abstraction from some determinate object. Um, to the concept of that object, but transcendental abstraction is abstraction to the concept of an object as such. Um, so, um, so, I mean, what Shelley says, ends up saying here is that, um, the explanation of how transcendental abstraction is possible, how we can actually do this, is, is going to be found in part four. But um, so but what he does in the third epic is explain what transcendental abstraction is and why it's necessary for knowledge. Um, so it's something we have to do in some sense, have to have already, already done, <laughs> although we don't know that we did it, <laughs> right? But it's something that we have to do to make what we normally think of as knowledge possible. Um, but it's something we have to do with absolute freedom. Now, I mean, absolute, as usual, whenever you see absolute, you, have, you know, you have to ask yourself, absolute is the opposite of relative. Right? So it's like, as opposed to freedom that's relative to something, like freedom to um, do something if you want to. <laughs> right? Like, um, in, in ordinary situations, that's enough to count as freedom. Right? Like, in, for example, in Locke's discussion of freedom, you know, he says, Freedom is the power to do something or not do it, depending on what you prefer. But absolute freedom would be the freedom to do it without presupposing anything. Um, and, you know, so the reason Shelley says that the explanation for this is going to have to come here is that it's only here at the beginning of part four that he explains how such an absolutely free act is possible. Um, and I guess, I mean, it should be clear why that explanation is like essential to practical philosophy. Right? That explanation of how an absolutely free act is possible. Right? Like the, the question that always comes up in ethics is um, how can I be held responsible for something? I must have done it. But uh, but uh, aren't the things that I that I do ultimately conditioned by causes that happened in the past that I can't affect anymore? They're in me or outside me. So like, how can I be responsible? I couldn't change the past, right? So that so that you know so a big question in practical philosophy and certainly for anyone coming after Kant is to explain how this kind of absolute freedom is possible but what Schelling is is doing in this transition is saying that in the end theoretical philosophy requires this right I mean it's, it's different from the relationship that Kant portrays between them which where in the theoretical philosophy all he does is keep it out of the way of, of the realm of freedom right say that you know it can't contradict anything that practical philosophy means. 
but Shelley is saying that um, theoretical philosophy is incomplete at points on to, to practical philosophy because it turns out that all knowledge requires an absolutely free act. Um, So, um, so what is, I mean, I kind of already said, maybe I shouldn't spend more time on this. I kind of already said what this act is, right? But maybe I should go into a little more detail. You know, so there's, The act of self-consciousness, this is what I was talking about last night, splits the ego up into two parts. There's the real activity, the ideal activity. And the real activity is the ego now made into an object for us. For itself. So this is object versus subject. And um, the because making it into an object involves imposing a boundary on it, um, the real activity is like turns out to be a kind of infinite struggle against the boundary. It's, it's constantly, um, there's always a boundary, which the boundary is really imposed by the ideal activity, right? It's the, it's the way it made itself finite in order to see itself as an object. But from the point of view of the real activity, it comes from elsewhere, it just seems alien. And the real activity is constantly pushing against this, and this is why there's time. <laughs> this is why uh, sense experience is like infinitely complicated. There's always more of it, right? So, um, um, so I mean. So what's really going on here, what Sean calls productive intuition, is that that you know it's the activity of the ego is making this boundary constantly recede, so to speak. And so that at the same time is the object and the representation of the object. It's producing both together, right? I mean that it has an object because there's this boundary for it. Um, and it represents the object because it pushes against the boundary. <laughs> so um, those two things always go together. And empirical abstraction means, um, taking apart those two pieces. So like, the part that was the boundary pushing it against me is the determinate sensible content um, or, or the determinate object, the individual singular object. And the part of me pushing back against the boundary is um, my, the, my use of my general nature to represent it, so to speak. So when, so, I mean, those two things are really, they're really the same. They have to go together because of where this boundary really comes from, right? Like the boundary really comes from this ideal activity that's just infinite, and that it's intuiting itself. So it has to be, it has to intuit itself as both finite and infinite. So it has to, it has to posit this boundary and the push against it, right? But um, but from the, but from the point of view of the real activity, those two things um, have to be taken apart for it to start to realize what's happening, basically. And 
they're 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 taken apart into a judgment and by the act of judgment. So something you always have to keep in mind in reading um, post-Kantian philosophy is that the German word for judgment is urteil. And so urteil literally means something like original division. <laughs> Now, um, I'm actually not sure why that ended up being the German word for judgment. Like etymologically speaking. Especially where the war comes from. Well, I don't know. Anyway, but if they, they, there's often some kind of play on the fact that the judgment is the original act of division, right? And so you can see how Schelling is understanding it, that judgment means like subject and predicate were the same. <laughs> and judgment is the act of taking them apart. So, so the act of taking this apart into, the, into a judgment is empirical abstraction. I think judgment is something like, you know, well, I mean, I guess fundamentally it's something like this is a horse. <laughs> um, I mean, in fact, this is always already the object of another concept, right? I mean, and you can see why, because this is, always comes from another previous, you know. So, um, but anyway, it's something like this is a horse, right? So, uh, like, this is, is the, is the push in that direction, or is, is the horse is the push in the other direction? You take them apart. Right. So that's empirical abstraction. And this abstraction basically is empirical knowledge, right? Like the point at which I have a representation that harmonizes or agrees with this object is the point at which I've managed to take them apart. <laughs> Before that, there was no agreement because they were together. <laughs> Right. So, um, but it's a different step. And this is the step that's called transcendental abstraction or absolute abstra abstraction is to um, understand that that's what's going on. <laughs> right. So Schelling describes this as intuiting the entire subject object. And um, I do that by seeing this productive activity itself, like understanding what this is in abstraction from all the different steps it goes through. So, um, so that's why this abstraction um, ends up with a transcendental concept, the concept of the object as such. As a po and on the other hand, it ends up with a concept of um, a representation of like what pushes back against the activity as such, which Schelling says is the representation of space. All right, so I'm not going to try to explain why that's the representation of space, but uh, but I mean, I guess, I mean, you can kind of understand, right? Space is externality. Right? It's the fact that something is outside my limits. That's right. So those are the two factors we've taken in apart here in transcendental abstraction. Now, why does this have to be in? So, so, and Shani says that even though um, we, you know, not being transcendental philosophers, we don't usually realize this. This act of transcendental abstraction is, in a sense, presupposed by empirical abstraction, right? Like we don't know that that's what we're doing, but um, but what we're doing in empirical abstraction wouldn't be possible if it weren't for that separateness in general. 
So, um, so that's again why he says the transcendent abstraction is in a sense presupposed by all knowledge, although in another sense it's kind of like the outcome, right? It's the end of part three. It's the final product of the philosophical, like, I don't know, recapitulation of the history of knowledge. <laughs> um, but, um, but in any case, so in one way, uh, however you look at it, this transcendental abstraction is necessary to the system of knowledge. It's, it's, it's what was established. And yet, why is it absolutely free? Well, because, you know, um, this series here is the time series. It's the series of acts being conditioned by prior acts. To abstract from the whole thing, um, I mean, is this, can this be made a little bit less hand wavy? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Schelling is, uh, I actually think Hegel is a lot better in this respect, although, although Hegel has other kinds of difficulties, but Schelling, I find, maybe I just haven't been thinking about it long, but, <laughs> but Schelling, I often find you get to a point where it's like, Okay, you can kind of see the connection there, but I wish you would lay it out in more steps, right? So, like, but yeah, so anyway, he says that this act of abstracting from the whole, uh, from any of these stages can't depend on a particular stage. I think that's the way of putting it. And, and like I, and I said, I'm not sure that's really an airtight argument, but <laughs> um, so that's why this has to be, this act of transcendental abstraction has to be an act of absolute freedom. Um, I mean, you know, maybe you can understand it better by saying something like, um, Yeah, maybe this is the way to put it. I have, I'm trying to intuit this whole subject object complex. And, you know, time is a characteristic that you only see from within this real activity. But now we're stepping outside of this. Now, ideal activity, even though I drew it as a line here, it's not in time. Okay, so it might be better to just draw it as a kind of, you know, We'll start. <laughs> it's you know so um, so uh, so this act of transcendental abstraction is an act of understanding that I'm not really in time, and that can't happen at a particular time. <laughs> Um, or at least, no, I mean, I actually, no, I shouldn't say that. He says it does happen at a particular time, but it can't be conditioned by what happened up to a particular time. You know, maybe I still don't have a good way to explain it. Anyway, that's the best I can do for now. I have to go on, um, unless there are questions. I mean, in case it's not clear, this stuff is really, that was really hard. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing my best to make it easier, but um, but without um, trying to hide the fact that it's really hard. <laughs> but the later authors we read, I think, I mean, in some ways are harder, right? Like Nietzsche, for example, is in some ways a really, really difficult philosopher to understand, but it's much more pleasant. To read. <laughs> the difficulty is of a different nature. Right? So, um, but anyway, I think I don't think you can understand what happened without seeing its origin in this. So, okay, so I'm going to go on to part four. Um, so, right, so it's like here, here we've just basically established the need for an absolutely free act. Um, and part four is going to start by explaining how an absolutely free act is possible. And um, uh, 
Um, well, so, I mean, two things about this. Number one, it should be clear on the face of it why an absolutely free act might seem impossible. <laughs> right? Like an absolutely free act is something I do. Since I do it, it must have been caused by me. Meaning, you would think it was caused by my state before I did. Right, so you know, this is me, and this is the time direction. Here, here's the act. If it was my act, it must have been caused by this stuff back here. Um, and of course, this stuff back here was caused by this stuff back here, etc. So, um, so this act can't be absolutely. It, it, it has to depend, like in the example I gave before, you know, it depends on my preference. So, I mean, I was free to do it in the sense that, um, given that that was my preference, <laughs> I would do it. But I wasn't free to make that my preference. You know, and that, this, this is the point which Locke says, and, and that's absurd, it's an infinite reference. What do you mean? You're wanting, you want to be free to also choose what you want? <laughs> right? But that's exactly what Kant and Schelling think is necessary for true morality, that there has to be that kind of absolute responsibility. So, but, it, but, and it, but it, on the other hand, it really does look like it's impossible. So um, that's one thing. And the other thing is, like, before I go into the details, just to say about idealism versus realism, right? So idealism, as Schelling understands it, is the view that the objects of my representations don't depend on me, right? So my representations are responsive to them rather than the other way around. Whereas, sorry, that's, sorry, that's realism, whereas, whereas Idealism is the view that the objects of my representation depend on them. And so, Schelling said in the introduction, I didn't talk about this too much, but in the introduction, he said, you know, uh, realism is the prejudice of theoretical philosophy. Theoretical philosophy starts off thinking, oh, the problem of knowledge is how to conform my representations to these things that don't depend on it. And the progress of transcendental philosophy in the theoretical part is to go from, to overcome the realist prejudice and go from realism to idealism. So at the end, you know, uh, uh, the, the consciousness that we're talking about is supposed to come to the understanding that the things um, that it knows depend on it, that they're products of its own activity. But he also said in the introduction, and you know, if you read just part three, you would think, and that's the moral, right? There's nothing that doesn't depend on the ego. But he also gave us a preview in the introduction of saying that on the other hand, idealism is the prejudice of practical philosophy. And I mean, this is a little bit harder to understand, but he, but it's not that hard to understand. The way he's thinking about it is that when I decide what to do, I'm thinking of the object as depending on my representation, right? Otherwise, what does my decision amount to? So, so he's, that's idealism. Every time you think about what to do, you're treating the world as an idealist. This is actually Hegel in the preface to the I think it's the preface to the phenomenology of spirit says that even the beasts know better than to be realists. When you present them with an object, they right away fall upon it and eat it. <laughs> and that shows that they're idealists. <laughs> so for Hegel, eating actually, for Hegel, eating literally is like. The same as understanding or something, but I mean, never mind. But okay, it's not just a metaphor. But anyway, getting back to Schelling. So, um, but Schelling says so in practical philosophy, transcendental philosophy is going to have the opposite task. 
to overcome idealism in favor of realism. So that's why suddenly in part four, surprised as other egos. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Having, having said that, the preliminary things. Um, 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 Right, so um, Yeah, I guess it's worth saying something about it. You know, I mean, and this is something that uh, in part three and part four, I began. Um, this is something that comes up in, in the post Kantian idealists in general. I think it's a very common feeling in Hegel that you get to the end of something and you feel like, okay, now everything is finished. Right? Like the subject understands that it's both subject and object and whatever, and we're done. And then all of a sudden, you, you have to start over again. Like, you know, so, um, and um, um, so, Um, I guess at least in order, at least in, is this true in the system too, or only the phenomenology of spirit? Certainly in this book and the phenomenology of spirit, like in order to um, get rid of that feeling that we were done and now we're starting over again, who knows why, or at least to, um, ameliorate it, uh, what you have to do is try to constantly keep in mind what the, the, our perspective as the philosophers is supposed to be, as opposed to the perspective of the, the consciousness we're thinking about. The consciousness we're thinking about is going through a certain history. And, you know, I mean, it's not exactly just one history, it kind of, maybe sometimes we have to go back to the beginning and see the whole development in a different light or whatever, but, um, but it's like the reason we're not finished is always that the consciousness we're talking about is not yet showing us consciousness. <laughs> like it hasn't, doesn't, hasn't yet worked out the whole system. <laughs> So, um, um, and um, so, you know, Shelley says that the, the, the philosopher actually like begins the whole series of consciousness over again freely at some point and now imitates it. Um, that's what we're supposed to be doing as we read this book. And um, so, uh, so there's like something like that at the beginning of part four, because there's an absolute free act, which begins a new series. But the new series it begins is just the series of the actions of an intelligence in the world. It's not the series it doesn't go back to the beginning of this and recapitulate it. Um, and um, um, and so, like, no matter as far as we go in this, it's always possible for the consciousness to get kind of like stuck there. 
there. <laughs> and that that is most people get stuck at one stage or another. So um, you know, this is where I'm, I mentioned before that this is kind of a there's something kind of dark about this view. This is on page 169. It is a hard saying, but no less true on that account, that just as innumerable men are basically unfitted for the highest functions of the spirit, right? So they're not philosophers or genius artists or whatever. So an equal multitude will never be capable of acting with that freedom and elevation of spirit over even law itself, which can be granted only to a chosen few. So like, I think it means that in some sense, I mean, only in some sense, <laughs> like, um, this is why this is so confusion, confusing. In some sense, every consciousness has to do all of these things, right? Like, you can't do anything or know anything without presupposing all of this, according to Shell. But nevertheless, like, most people, in a sense, get stuck here. And um, they never really act freely. Um, So in some sense, are they really rational beings then? Like, are they among the intelligences that he's gonna count in the in part four? I'm not, I'm not sure. It's like kind of ambiguity. Um, okay, but all right, anyway, that was kind of a separate thing that I wanted to say about that transition. Now let me say something about the system of practical philosophy in part four. So, um, so this weird backward thing where we're going from idealism to realism is, um, I mean, you can think of it this way, in the theoretical philosophy, you're going from realism to idealism, meaning you're showing that what looked like passivity was actually a result of activity. Right, that you know, we it seems to us, and at a certain level of consciousness, it's true that all our knowledge of the world is due to things affecting us. We're passive. Um, but by the time we get to the end, we realize that those quote unquote things affecting us are that's our activity. <laughs> right? That was us. So um so it's like the possibility of knowledge, which is, a, I mean, knowledge is a, is a kind of passivity, right? That is, it means having your representation be responsible to something else. The possibility of this kind of passivity, which is necessary for knowledge, actually depends on an activity. So, um, so now we're gonna get the same thing. In reverse, it's going to turn out that the possibility of absolute activity or absolute freedom depends on my passivity. Depends on the fact that um, I'm responsible to something else that's not me. That's what makes the activity that constitutes freedom possible. Now, I think, I'm not sure if Schelling would agree with me about this. Maybe he would or maybe he wouldn't. I think that that, that idea is actually really non-Kantian or anti-Kantian, right? That is, I don't think there's anything like that in abstract philosophy. Um, but um, lots of other people have ideas like that. <laughs> so, I mean, it, on the one hand, like the people we see going forward in the course are a lot of them going to be 
dealing with a, a similar type of idea. But also, before Kant, um, there's a thought very much like this in Leibniz. And um, that's not just like a random name drop or something, because in this uh, part at the beginning of, of beginning of part four, there's like Schelling constantly alludes to Leibniz. I don't remember if he actually mentions Leibniz by name, but it doesn't matter whether he does or not, right? Because he talks about pre-established harmony and monads and etc. Right? It's all Leibniz talk. So, um, so actually, my plan in order to understand what Schelling is saying is to first talk about the version of this that's actually in Leibniz. And then, because it's less paradoxical and easier to understand than Schelling's version of it, and then try to explain how Schelling's version is different. Um, and I know that two years ago, I tried to do the same thing, and I ended up spending so much time talking about Leibniz that I didn't get back to Schelling, and I hope that won't happen again. <laughs> but it might. All right. But anyway, so, um, OK. Again, I think a lot. I determined a lot of people did take the rationalists before. The, I don't know if everyone did. But um, so, I mean, but. Anyway, I'll try to briefly summarize what the context is here in Leibniz. So, according to Leibniz, the right. So, so from now on until I say so, I'm talking about Leibniz and not directly talking about Schelling, right? So, according to Leibniz, the whole world of finite things uh, consists of These things that he calls monads. Um, so, what is a monad? Well, um, every monad is kind of like a mind. It's kind of like a mind. Um, it has faculties of representation and appetition. It has faculties of rep representation and application. So, um, like, they don't all literally have minds, but they all have something like sense and an appetite. Um, but ammonia has. No windows and no doors. That is um, nothing from outside the monad affects it, and the monad doesn't affect anything outside itself. So the appetite of the monad, if, um, if I draw the time direction this way again, Here's the monad. The appetite of the monad is always for its own future state. Um, and its action is always to achieve that state. So, right, all it does is it wants to be in its own future state and it acts on that desire and achieves that future state and so on. Now, the states themselves are, the, are perceptions. So the monad is like, is a, it's like a perception plus a desire for the next perception. <laughs> um, so, um, and again, nothing acts from outside. So this whole series is just determined by its own nature. 
right? Whatever its own nature is as a monad prescribes at each step what it's going to desire next. And that's always what it gets. <laughs> so, um, um, so the whole series, so to speak, develops or unfolds from the, the one internal principle of the monad. Okay, so I mean, this is already enough to show that in a way, everything the monad does is free. Right? Its act all proceed from its own principle and not from anything else. And um, I mean, I think like to understand all of these people, you have to realize that, um, I mean, this applies even to, to Locke and like, he, the, they don't take freedom to be the opposite of necessity. They take freedom to the opposite of compulsion, right? So in a sense, the fact that it's the monad's own nature that causes this progress means that it's free, even though it, it, it couldn't have done anything else, right? But, but it wouldn't want, it didn't want to do anything else. It did exactly what it wanted to, right? So, um, however, so in some sense, all of Leibniz's and Monad are already free. But this kind of freedom doesn't seem to be consistent with moral responsibility. And, um, um, and the reason is that moral responsibility seems to involve a possible divergence between what I did and what I should have done. There's something I should do, but I might not do what I should do. And if I don't, then I'm to blame. I, I'm responsible. That's what moral responsibility is about. Um, but, you know, this monad is always doing exactly what it should do. Um, it's doing what's best for it. Best for it because it's what its own nature requires, right? But it, I mean, it's also what seems best to it at that time, and it seems best to it correctly, <laughs> right? So, um, so, so, right. So the so the problem with this, from the point of view of, of morality, is not that. Um, the money I can't do the right thing, but I can't do the wrong thing. <laughs> so, um, so Leibniz says, well, yeah, so as a matter of fact, um, your average ordinary monad is not free in that moral sense. And right, so like what, I mean, what, where are these monads in the world? Um, you know, uh, I don't want to get into all the details of life. This is metaphysics, but, um, but you know, uh, when we see organized bodies, animals and plants, um, that's our way, that, that's the way certain monads appear to us, basically. Um, they appear to us as a certain kind of body. And again, since the whole world consists of monads, as Leibniz says that the whole world, if you looked at it closely enough, you would find that it's organized. Right? Like, you know, this is his famous thing about how the world is like a fish pond, except the water in between the fish is, is full of much smaller fish. And the water in between the smaller fish is full of much, much smaller fish. And if you look inside the fish, you'll see that inside the fish, there's much smaller fish. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, it was, you know, discovery we made with the microscope obviously suggested that something like this might be true. But, um, but on the other hand, the microscope can't see infinite details. So, you know, um, Leibniz, on his own principles, had to had to prove that you could you could keep going all the way. 
Um, all right. So anyway, um, so there's so most monads are basically like souls of animals and plants, or even like kind of sub plants, you know, um, just very simple types of organisms. But um, but rational monads, which is what we are, um, um, have this additional faculty. Now, how this exactly is added on to a monad is something I don't really understand very well about like this. Um, Shelley, in taking over this system, gets rid of all the non-rational monads, right? There's nothing about anything outside of me that's not an intelligence in part one. So Shelley doesn't have this problem. I don't know exactly how to explain it in Leibniz. But anyway, in Leibniz, a rational monad, as he puts it, is a monad that, quote, has the right to say I, that is, it's self-conscious. To a certain extent, it knows its own principle. And so to a certain extent, it understands why this is the best thing to happen next. I guess I should have put in one other thing, namely that why this is this is famous, right? But that why this is an optimist, meaning in a technical sense that um, he thinks that this is the best of all possible worlds. So, um, and again, that's something you know he doesn't just think; he thinks he can prove that this is the best of all possible worlds. So that means that that the monads that actually exist in doing what's best for themselves are actually part of doing of everything doing the best possible thing right so it's not just like uh the best in some kind of selfish sense but it's actually the best thing that, that could that anything could do in that position at that time so um um right so the rational monads have some understanding of that I mean, I think you can think of a rational monad basically as a monad that's capable of carrying out Descartes' meditations. That's the best way to understand what, I mean, I, I think that's literally what Leibniz has in mind here when he talks about it. But a monad is able to, to, to understand for itself something of the plan of the world and why, um, why what it wants is the best thing for it and for the world as a whole. So, um, but it has some understanding of that, but not complete understanding. That's the key point, right? Only God, according to Leibniz, has the complete understanding of why this is the best possible world, or even of why this is the best state for this moment of next. Even finite rational monads only have a limited, clear understanding. Of course, in the monad, there's the complete understanding in the sense that there's the principle that will make all these things happen. But the monad, the, the monad self-consciousness doesn't go that far. It only gets to part of that. And this explains why the monad can not do what it should do. Because what it should do is what seems to get the best thing. Again, we're talking about a rational monad, right? So, it, I mean, of course, it has a desire for what it's going to do, and that's what it's going to do. But it also has some limited understanding of what the best thing to do would be. What it should do is what follows from that limited understanding. So what happens when it does the wrong thing is it's weird. It's like backwards and paradoxical. I said it's less paradoxical than showing, but it's still weird and paradoxical, right? What happens when it does the wrong thing is that it does what's actually best, but which it, what it doesn't know to be best, what seems to it not to be best. And that's what it's to blame for, <laughs> right? I mean, you might say, well, how can I blame it? It couldn't have done anything else. Well, but you know, it was due to its own nature <laughs> that this happened, not to something else. So due to its own nature, 
It did. I mean, maybe like I mean, in a less stream or tactical sense, this is an idea that you often hear in in theodicy, right? Like the explanations of why you know why human evil is is compatible with being caused by God or something like that, right? So they, you know, so they'll say, and I mean, Leibniz also says things like this, only he, he elevates it to complete systematicity, right? So they'll say that, like, um, if someone murders someone else, then actually dying at that time was what that person deserved for some reason, or was best for them for some reason. So, um, so like, uh, so the fact that they were murdered actually like referred to God's knowledge of the whole was not an evil. It was the right thing to happen then. Perhaps it was just punishment for something or, or preventing something worse that would have happened when they, when they lived or I don't know. But anyway, so, but then you say, well, so why is the murderer responsible? And the answer is, well, the murderer didn't know about God's plan. The murderer was just trying to do something bad. <laughs> right? That's what that's what Leibniz is saying about these moments. There really is a reason why what they do next is the best, but they don't know it. So they so they can't claim credit as rational beings for that action. As far as they were concerned as rational beings, it was the wrong thing to do, and that's what they're responsible for. So, um, okay. So, I mean, so far I haven't discussed the relationship between this monad and any other monad. Right? So, um, but this is where this comes in. What does it mean that this action is really best? Right? Like, in what respect is it best? Um, so at least part of the answer is that these states are perceptions. That is, they represent, although not clearly, a whole universe of other monads. And there actually are other monads. And um, at least part of what, if not all, of what makes this state good for this monad is that it accurately represents the other monads that are up. That is, it's good for these monads to harmonize with each other. Um, this, again, is really just a development of something in Descartes. This is, it, it's saying that the goodness of God is expressed in that God is not a deceiver. Right? Um, whereas in Descartes, that was just like one kind of evil that could befall me, although it was the only kind we knew about at the beginning of the meditation. Was, right? Like the only imperfection I knew about in the world is that I was sometimes wrong about something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but for for Leibniz, like um, that is at least the fundamental way there could be something wrong with the monad is to be deceived. So in the best possible world, none of the monads are deceived. So in the best of all possible worlds, all the monads are in harmony. So even though they don't act on each other, so even though this perception isn't a result of something that this other monad did to it, because of this pre-established harmony, this perception represents this other monad correctly. Although again, not clearly, right? So it's not, so the, so the reason it seems to us that the world is made of bodies and, you know, like, uh, and some of them are homogeneous and they don't seem to be organized and whatever. Like, all of that is because our perception is unclear and it basically like blurs infinitely many monads together. Um, but it's not, but there's nothing wrong. We're not deceived. We just like don't have full clarity. 
Great. So um, now, I mean, no, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. So um, um, okay. So. Um, So if suppose this other monad, suppose this monad is me and this monad is someone else. So um, suppose this other monad, someone else, has a clearer perception of me than I have of them. I don't know how to draw this, but here's my perception of them. It's kind of like blurry. Their perception of me is clearer. Uh, I don't know if you can tell I'm trying to draw it or not. But um, so um, what that means is that, um, so to speak, I have to conform to their perception more than they have to conform to my perception. I mean, that is, that's the sense that Leibniz thinks you, we can give to the idea that one monad is active and the other is passive. I mean, they both really contain a representation of everything that's going to happen to all monads in the world ever. <laughs> but um, but there's a sense in which at this point, this I'm following the representation of this monad more than it's following my representation because its representation was clearer. So clearer equals more active for Leibniz, and less clear equals more passive. Um, and one other thing, because it's the best of all possible worlds, the world is full. <laughs> Meaning, among other things, or maybe this is all it ultimately means for, for Leibniz. Meaning that for every unclarity here, there's a corresponding clarity somewhere else. Right? Like no finite mode has a completely clear representation of anything, really, even itself. Only God has that. But all taken together, they have a clear representation of everything. Um, that's like the fullness or completeness of the world. Where there's no room for another one. If you added another monad, it would be deceived. Right? So there's somewhere there's a clear representation of everything. So what that means is that for every passivity in me, somewhere there's a corresponding activity in another moment. And then you have to add one more thing, which is a little bit mysterious, but anyway, I'll just add it, which is that, I mean, is it or not? It's it's all mysterious to to to. Okay, well, so here's the thing. So the thing is that lack of self knowledge is a type of, for rational monads is a type of unclarity of representation. So to the extent that I don't understand why it is that you know this is the next state for me, what that means is that this state is unclear in a certain way. I mean, what's mysterious is what is that way and how is it related to the usual way of being unclear? <laughs> but I mean, but it's, I mean, it's not surprising really that, that that's a kind of unclarity, right? It means that I don't like see fully into my own nature. So, um, So when you put these things together, it means that um,
if I am unable to um, to act freely in a certain way, that is, if I am unable to act that way as a rational mode. And remember, that's that's the situation where I'm not doing where I sh what I should. This is a situation where I'm not acting freely, considered as a rational mode. Um, it's because somewhere else, there's a monad that does clearly represent my act. And the other monad, so to speak, has a right to demand that I act in that way that it perceives is best. I mean, so to speak, I, I mean, literally, I guess, let's think of this in legal terms, right? Those monads have rights against God, basically, not to be deceived. That's their right. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so this, this monad can demand that I act in the way that it clearly perceives and that I don't. Um, so whatever I don't do freely, it's because um, another monad has, so to speak, like used up the activity that I would have needed <laughs> to act freely. So it's like as if. And now I'm coming back more into contact with Schelling here. It's like as if there's a certain amount of activity to be shared out in the world. And um, um, activity for, for Leibniz meaning clarity. Um, so there's a certain amount of clarity, it's like self-knowledge for these rational monads to share out between themselves. And um, um, the reason I don't get all of it is because other people get something. <laughs> so the reason why my acts are not, so in other words, so even though this is what I guess is important here, what happens when I when I don't act freely as a rational monad? I always act freely as a monad per se, right? That I'm always following my own nature. So when I don't act freely as a rational monad, that is, I don't act according to what I what I understand to be best. Then um, um, something is compelling me not to. Now, but what's compelling me not to is not directly this other monad. Right? It's not acting on me. I'm not pushing against it. Monads have no windows and no doors. What's compelling me is actually my own nature. Um, but there's a sense in which this monad um, is responsible for that compulsion. Namely, that although this monad can't make it happen, this monad has a right to demand it all. Um, and so finally, when I do act freely, it's because none of the other monads demanded anything about that action more than I did. So I got that part <laughs> of the activity. Um, Now, I mean, I guess you could ask, well, why doesn't God just make all the monads be clear about it? Um, and um, the answer to that question is also relevant to what Schelling is, going to, is saying in part four, because the answer is, how are these monads different from each other? What makes them different? They all represent the exact same world, the best of all possible worlds.
And of course, Leibniz is famous for another thing he's famous for, the principle of identity of indiscernibles. If there's no intrinsic differences between them, they're the same thing. <laughs> so um, they all represent the same world. Why are they not just one world? And the answer is the only difference between them is the difference in clarity. Or, as we can also say, the difference in activity. So God literally couldn't make a world where that contained infinitely many monads, all of which all represented each other with perfect clarity. It's impossible because those would, those would all be the same moment. Right. So, um, um, so individuation, this, the fact that every monad has this component of passivity in it is a requirement of individuation to be a determinate monad and not any of the others. Um, right, so as Schelling, getting back to Schelling, as he says on page 168, um, imagine a quantum of activity, as it were, to be distributed over the whole order of rational beings. Every one of them has the same right to the total, but in order simply to be active at all, it has to be active in a particular way. If it could appropriate the whole quantum to itself, then only absolute passivity would be left over for all rational beings outside it. So, uh, So, yeah, I mean, I think, I guess you can see from that quote how close Schelling really is to Leibniz, the way I've just explained Leibniz. I think Schelling, in a way, follows almost everything that I just said, um, except, so there's some important differences. So, number one, I already mentioned that, um, that his world of monad is a world of intelligences. There's only rational animals. Um, now, I mean, well, actually, let me say the other one and then try to say something about why, because I think they have a similar explanation. Um, but I'll just say that feature that I mentioned in Leibniz is already, I mean, in Schelling is already present in Kant, right? So in, in Kant, what corresponds to this world of monads is what's called the kingdom of ends. In the practical philosophy, according to Kant, when we think about what the world contains, we think of it as containing um, other wills like ourselves. This is called the kingdom of ends. Um, right, we don't think of it as containing uh, sub-rational, intelligible beings, like the like the animal or vegetable monads. So, um, but I mean, so that sort of explains why this happens in Schelling. But of course, it doesn't, you know, historically explains that. But doesn't explain what he's thinking. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that he doesn't appeal to any. Did I erase the word optimism? Right up here, in order to make sense, right? That um, uh, for Schelling, we don't have to invoke optimism to explain the harmony between the different intelligences. I'm not sure exactly why or how Schelling is using this word intelligence. 
Um, right, he uses the Latin, you know, he uses the Latin word just Germanized intelligence. Um, but it's clearly supposed to be synonymous to rational being, right? Sometimes he uses rational being instead. Um, so I think both of those differences, so maybe I should do this in a more organized way. Only rational monads. No appeal to optimism. Um, so I think both of these things are sort of explained by what he says on page 164, or are supposed to be explained by it anyway. Um, Among intelligences which are to act on each other through freedom, there must then in the first place be a pre-established harmony in regard to the common world which they present, that is represent. For since all determinacy in the intelligence comes about only through the determinacy of its presentations, intelligences who intuited utterly different worlds would have absolutely nothing in common no point of contact which they could come together. Since I draw the concept of intelligence solely from myself, an intelligence that I am to recognize as such must stand in the same conditions in intuiting the world as I do myself. Now, so, I mean, a lot of that I don't completely understand, but what he's saying is that, um, like what does this have to do about with the determinacy? I mean, that thing, right? When he said, since all determinacy in the intelligence comes about only through the determinacy of its presentation, that's the same thing that I was saying, that the monads only differ from each other due to, yeah, actually maybe it's like, I do kind of understand what he's saying. The monads are only different from each other due to the different nature of their presentations of the same thing. <clears throat> clarity, the difference is clarity or unclarity. So I think what Schelling is saying is that when I think of an intelligence different from myself, I can only think of it as something that represents the same world, but differently. Um, Still not sure I understand exactly how that argument is supposed to work. That's what is that is what he's saying. Since I draw the concept of intelligence solely from myself, right? Okay. So I mean, so one other piece here. So um, what when I when I represent a different intelligence, I'm representing an intelligence different from myself. I start with my intuition of myself, and then I try to think of something like me, but different. And so, and Schelling is claiming that the only way to do that is to think of its presentations of the same thing as different from mine. So that's why I think of it as in a kind of harmony with me that constitutes being in the same world. Um, or like, that's really what it means to, to be in the same world, right? Because it's, I mean, it's not like, 
Um, um, the end of part three was idealism, right? It's not like there's this world of, you know, rocks and trees and whatever that intelligences are plunked down into. It's, you know, the world is there because they represent something. So for the other intelligence to be in the same world as me means that I, I think of them as um, having the same representation I do, but differently. And that's what it means that we're in the same world that we harmonize with each other. So, um, so on the one hand, that's why we get only rational moments here, right? I start with myself as an intelligence and think of something that differs from itself in the clarity for me in the clarity of its self consciousness at different points, basically. Um, and it's also why we need no appeal to optimism. And just that part, Schelling says himself at the bottom of the same page, um, right? Only here the explanation should not venture to extend further to some absolute principle, which by operating as the communal focus of intelligences or their creator and agent of uniformity, parentheses, concepts wholly unintelligible to us should contain the common basis of their agreement in regard to objective presentations. I don't know. <laughs> it's, reading that aloud, does it sound like anything? I, I feel like... So I've gotten used in teaching over Zoom to, to having a document camera showing the text that I'm reading, which would make it easier. But now I don't know how to do that in real life. I mean, I could use that thing, but then I would have to bring the screen down. Well, anyway, so, uh, so I'm not sure if you were able to follow that when I read it aloud, but, you know, he say what he's saying is wholly unintelligible to us is that, that the explanation of this harmony would be some kind of communal focus or creator and agent of uniformity, which contains the common basis of their agreement. In other words, what Leibniz calls God, right? So he's saying that, that Leibniz is God is a con is wholly unintelligible to us. To us, meaning as it seems to his seems to say in other places, like to us these days, <laughs> right? In this more modern age, whatever. Um, I mean, God in a way does still come into his system, but it's in a weird way. Like, and we're not going to read that part, but like on page 211, for example, he says, for God never exists if the existence is that which presents itself in the objective world. If he existed thus, then we should not, <laughs> right? Meaning that if there were some um, absolutely perfect being, there would be no room left for, right? He would have all the activity. <laughs> there would be no room, room left for anything else. In other words, Spinoza would be right, which, Schelling actually, you know, says that Spinoza is like the best you can do with realism or something like that. It's like the only consistent realism, but he still thinks it's wholly unintelligible or, you know. So anyway, so, but, but, you know, so, but fortunately he's saying we don't need to appeal to that. There must be harmony between me and the other intelligences that, um, that arise for me in, or that, that I posit for this reason. Okay, so um, so now let me finally go back and explain with these differences in mind, you know, how from Shelley's point of view, um, an absolutely free act is explained by, although not caused by the existence of other rational beings. Um, So if we look again at like at the difference between the ideal and real activities. Oops, real and ideal activities. Um, Insofar as an intelligence or a rational being is purely ideal, 
it's um, and therefore purely free. It's so to speak fit to be the cause of any act, right? Like it has, it has so to speak infinite power. I mean, it does have infinite power, not in the sense of having more power than finite power, but in the sense of having power in which no limit has been established, right? Because the limit is only, is only established here, right? So it has infinite power. It's um, considered in itself, it would cause every act or the object of every act. And again, those are kind of the same. It would cause all of them, or you might also say it's transcendentally free, right? It's what it's, what it's capable of causing is an object as such, not any determinate object. But no act can happen at all unless the intelligence somehow gets limited to a determinate object. Now, I mean, that actually um, is uh, what I just said, although people nodded when I said it, it's not obvious. That's basically what Spinoza denies, right? Like, so Spinoza says, yes, there's one thing, and it's absolutely free and it has infinite power. And if you ask, how does it decide what to do? He says, it doesn't decide what to do. It does everything, right? So all possible things in every possible way follow from the eternal and infinite essence of God. That's Spinoza's view. But Schelling, again, as we saw before, is following Kant in saying, that if there's a, um, the, the negation that makes one thing different from another can't arise just by zero. That like, to negate a positive, you have to have an opposite positive. And um, um, that means that according to Schelling in a cause, well, I mean, Schelling is applying this outside the realm where Kant would think this, we, we have a right to apply this principle. But nevertheless, according to Schelling and Kant, when um, it's not possible to do everything in every way because they're inconsistent with each other. Or maybe a better way to put it, it's not like they're logically inconsistent with each other. They, they cancel each other out. Right? Like, so one thing is going a mile in this direction, another thing is going a mile in this direction. If you do both of them, you just stay there. <laughs> um, so, so even though the intelligence itself regarded as purely ideal is absolutely free, it can't do anything. Um, so the way this works then is that um, all the other intelligences taken together um, claim a right to every act except one. <laughs> Now, I mean, when I say they claim a right to that act, it's not, of course, that like, you know, I mean, it's not, of course, this. What it is might be hard to understand, but it's not, of course, that like, if I pick up this chalk rather than leaving it, then someone else leaves it there, <laughs> right? Like sticks their hand in and leaves it there or something, right? But it's something, but it's, it's like what, you know, the Leibniz was saying that, you know, um, um, all the other things I don't do are, are somehow things that, um, that some other intelligence represents better than I do. And, and they do what from their point of view is, is, is that. So I don't, yeah, like I said, it's clear what it's not. It's hard to explain what it is. But I think, you know, so, 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 
so so to speak everything except one thing that is or this is what happens when i act freely with absolute freedom when i act with absolute freedom what happens is that um except for one thing everything else that i could have done is is somehow taken up by another intelligence that does it somewhere else again so to speak it's not the same thing that it does but it does the equivalent of it or something like that um and therefore my infinite freedom gets expressed in this one act that i still have a right to and not in any of the others and that's how i'm able to do something <laughs> So, right, so notice that, like, that act I actually did was not compelled in any way. It followed from my own pure freedom and infinite power. Nothing else pushed me to do it. But it also wasn't explained by my own prior state. Because my own prior state um, was sufficient to explain every possible act. <laughs> Not just this one. Um, so as as Schelling says, the 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 other intelligences are the negative condition of possibility for my free act, meaning that by not claiming this one act, they allow me to do it freely. And similarly, I'm the negative condition for for all of their acts. Right? By doing this one, I leave all the other ones left over for them. Um, that's, and that all put together constitutes the harmony between us. Um, and so finally, this explains why, and this, I guess, maybe is another difference from Leibniz, or it's, it's kind of related to this difference. You know, if you ask Leibniz, how do I know that there's any monads outside of me? Because, you know, suppose only this one monad existed, you would still have the same perception. How do I know there's any monads outside of me? Well, I infer it from optimism. I mean, there has to be, of course, an independent proof of the existence of God, which Leibniz thinks there is. And then if you put that in and say that, of course, God would have made the best possible world, so God is not a deceiver, right? So therefore, it follows, I infer that something actually exists corresponding to my representation, namely the other moments. Um, but Schelling says um, it's not an inference. It's immediately known, it's intuitive. How is it known? Every time I do anything freely, I thereby know that there's all these other intelligences because otherwise it would have been possible. So from the practical standpoint, from the standpoint of deciding what to do, the end result is I should be a realist. Right, that is, I should think that I, I, or I must be a realist, right? I must, in order to take this, take up the standpoint of deciding what to do, which presupposes my freedom, I must know that there are other egos outside of me. Okay, uh, that's why I have time for, and it's pretty much the end of this. So uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Bye. Bye, people. Internet world.